This talk is really about um, translational science and how do you take a discovery from the bench to the clinic, test it in humans, commercialize it, and I hope that I, I can give you an appreciation of the different career choices that are involved in doing this that most, um, most people don't get exposed to. So um, can everybody hear me okay? Do I need this? No? Do I need it, Moro? Do I need it for the, the tele... If they don't complain, uh, that's fine. Okay. Then we show up if something doesn't work. Okay. So the goals of the talk today are, are to provide an understanding of what is translational research, what is product development, um, what are the regulations, and why are they there. <coughs> Um, and then the various roles and specializations that people um, are, uh, that the whole activity requires to execute a very large project like this. Um, try to give you an appreciation of what drives uh, bioprocess design and testing, and re hopefully. <laughs> Uh, give you a realization of how training in the basic and translational clinical sciences can be applied to translational research. Okay. So everybody knows this. What are the applications of biotechnology? Well, um, healthcare, agriculture, food processing, waste management. My talk today will, will concentrate mostly on biopharmaceuticals because this is really one of the hardest, most difficult product classes to bring into um, commercialization. So biopharmaceuticals encompass uh, recombinant proteins, uh, mon including monoclonal antibodies, vaccines, gene therapies, which I think is, is uh, one of the main focus here, um, blood and plasma-derived products, and then cells and, and uh, tissues. Okay, so really biotechnology is, is the bringing together of genetic engineering and chemical engineering and, and what's shown here is this is where um, insulin used to be harvested for, for human use and use in diabetes. Obviously um, engineering E. coli or yeast to express that human protein and then making it in a bioreactor. Well, you know, everybody says, well, that's interesting, but, and, and it may be obvious, but the, the real issue here is that by moving it from here to here, you've made a process that is very highly controlled, okay? And so, the control and understanding of manufacturing processes for products that go into humans is one of the main themes of my talk today. Okay, um, to give you the economic um, perspective of what these proteins uh, are capable of, this is a short list of recombinant proteins that are for sale. Each one of these generates in the billions of dollars in revenue. This is what makes Genentech and it makes Bayer and, and uh, these large companies grow, prosper, and have money for R&D. So this is a real economic engine to develop these products and, and improve people's lives uh, with those products. <clears throat> and what's the difference between bi a biologic and a small molecule? Well, small molecule therapeutics are really what comprise the traditional pharmaceuticals. And they have classically been developed through chemical syntheses. Um, they're usually taken you know, orally, topically, or transdermally, um, absorbed through the intestine, and, and usually they're designed to block targets. Okay. Biopharmaceuticals are much more sensitive to the manufacturing process, storage, how they're administered. Uh, again, they're produced through a living system. They require extensive purification. So instead of these syntheses, 
you're actually trying to purify something out of a very complex mixture. And then that processing is extremely complex. There's no terminal sterilization, okay? So you can't gamma irradiate or treat with ethylene oxide or um, do steps that traditional devices and, bio and pharmaceuticals can use. Uh, so that means that the conditions must be controlled, that they have to be aseptic through the entire process. You have to control temperature because these are biologic molecules that are heat labile, um, susceptible to humidity, time is a factor. How f quickly can you take the starting material and purify it before that molecule loses its activity? And then also, where do you get the raw materials? All of that uh, goes into controlling the process. So translational research, what I'm going to talk a lot about today is, is taking a bench discovery, and I think what I heard yesterday just in my um, few conversations is that there's a lot of discovery that's going on here. And how do you take a bench discovery and identify out of those different discoveries what a lead is, okay? What is your lead molecule, okay? So if you identify 50 genes, at some point you have to pick one of them because you can't develop 50 of them at a time. It's just too cost prohibitive. So which one is your best target? Which one is your lead? And once you determine that, then you have to go through a process of developing, manufacturing, and testing technology. You then have to meet with the regulatory agencies and have what's called a pre-IND meeting where you discuss the clinical trial and the toxicology design. Then you conduct formal toxicology studies under a set of laws called good laboratory practices that pertain specifically to animal studies. You manufacture the product under a different set of laws called good manufacturing practices. You prepare an IND, and IND is essentially you're requesting permission to test your product in a human being for the first time. So you submit that to the regulatory agencies, they review it, and then they give you permission to conduct clinical trials in humans under a different set of laws called good clinical practices. And then if all of that is successful, if you can show efficacy and safety in human beings, then they give you a license to sell the product. Okay? So translational biotechnology, these activities are absolutely foundational for companies. Merck, Pfizer, this is how products are discovered, developed, tested, but they're increasingly gaining importance in academic settings where the technologies are being uh, tested in humans before entering the commercial sector. So what drives that? Well, rare diseases are an area of therapeutics that large pharma companies aren't that interested in. Because if you're dealing with small populations, there's not enough uh, sales of the product to re recoup the dollars that are invested into the whole translational process. So at least in the United States, academic institutions are, are more and more becoming involved in translational research to take those discoveries happening at the universities and bringing them at least to phase one human trials before trying to commercialize them and have license that technology to a company. Okay. So the point of this slide is that I'm going to talk a lot about companies and department roles and, and the responsibilities of various people with fancy titles in their, in their names, but really more and more academic institutions are building these types of organizations that look like companies, but um, uh, are, are really uh, organized around a project. 
Okay, so for product development, there's a lot of act different activities from understanding the disease, uh, generating animal models, creating the biologic construct, your favorite gene, putting it under the right promoter um, to express that biologic, doing some efficacy studies in animals to show that that molecule is therapeutic, and then doing formal toxicology studies, human clinical trials, and then commercializing that. So running parallel are scientists that are developing analytical technology to understand the product, to understand the product's performance in animals and in humans, and then scientists that are developing manufacturing processes that then when it is time to manufacture the product, there's analytical and, and biochemistry and lots of other foundational science um, areas that, that come together. So this is taken from the FDA website, starting with the lead, uh, then you do some animal testing, you submit an IND, Again, that's the request for permission to test in humans. Then you do these f different phases of human trials, phase one, two, and three. And if everything works out, you submit a new drug, ap a new drug application. That's a request to license and sell the product. And then you can start to sell your product, okay? So the perspective is that this is very expensive to go through this pathway. Toxicology costs upwards of a half a million dollars. A phase one human clinical trial averages at least a million dollars, probably more like two million. It's long term, so you know, as, as a as a scientist, you're you're used to having answers as fast as you can and, and, and you know, it's, it's about being rapid and, and, and getting, getting uh, uh, results. Here the perspective, the cycle is just much longer, years and months. So if you wanted to do a clinical trial today, if, if um, Morrow said we're going to take this gene to the clinic today, it wouldn't go into a human being for probably about two years, 18 months to two years, if that commitment was made today and you had the money today, okay? Um, the other issue is um, you're locked in, okay? So if you make a construct, you take a gene, that's your lead gene, you put it behind the CMV promoter and that's your product, that's your lead and you start down this path and you start doing toxicology and you start having pre-IND meetings and then another one of your postdocs finds out that there's a better promoter or there's a better gene. If you make, it, it, you'll have to make a decision at some point looking at all the money that was, has in, and time that was invested up to that point and making a decision whether to go back and change, whether it's the promoter or the gene. So once you start down this path, you're locked, you're really locked in and, and companies have to decide uh, frequently whether the lead that they're working on should go forward, they should abandon it, they should do a, a new lead. Um, and so it's really a balance between looking at the cost and the time invested versus Saving. So if you were making a, a, a gene product and you found a new promoter that produced that product 10 times better, you would really have a hard choice whether you stop the lead at that point and go to the promoter that's 10 times better. Because in the end, 10 years from now, the promoter that's 10 times better may make the cost of your product much cheaper. 10 times cheaper. So you have to balance whether you make that switch, okay? The other thing is it takes many people, there's just a huge amount of work 
that has to be done to get something to the clinic, and it requires a lot of different expertise. Okay, so the perspective is really one from looking from the end to the beginning. Okay, so you really need to know what your human trials are going to look like in order to design your toxicology study, in order to know how much you need to make. So knowing where the project's going um, will will lead to a high rate of success. It will reduce errors and reduce costs. Um, I run a manufacturing facility, and we have clients come to us that say, you know, we're ready to manufacture this product right now, and because they've made a strategic mistake five years ago, they have to go back to the start and redo everything because they didn't characterize a cell line or they didn't sequence their gene or whatever it is. Um, so knowing what the clinical trial looks like, knowing what the toxicology study looks like, and then also having a, appreci an appreciation of the regulations. So in the US, um, there's different layers of regulations. I don't want to spend too much time on this, just to give you a sense that there are uh, people not only in the U.S. but also in, in Europe and then in each country in Europe who um, enforce these regulations. And, and in the U.S. it's the FDA and, a, and their main mission is to safeguard the public health, to make sure that patients participating in these trials are protected and ultimately the patients that are receiving these products um, prescribed by their doctor are protected. The NIH, OBA, is really uh, an agency that is reviewing novel therapies to make sure that um, uh, there's a public forum and a debate that these new therapies should be tested and, and what are their, their um, positive and negative uh, risk factors. Okay. Then there's an expectation that at the site that these clinical trials are conducted, that there is on-site review. So an investigational review board um, really looks at the risk benefits of the study and uh, patient protection, informed consent. And then the Institutional Biosafety Committee reviews the actual agent that's being tested to make sure that it is um, safe. So the IND process is sketched out here. This is, this is, there are going to be slight variations uh, in each country, but usually a pre-IND meeting is held. Again, you're telling the regulators, you're thinking about this, this is what my clinical trial looks like. It's 30 patients, at, it's 10 patients at three different doses over two years. Um, and then my toxicology package is going to be done in rodents and dogs at these different doses. And you, sub you, you submit the, those sketches of your clinical trial and your toxicology trial in a pre-IND meeting to get feedback from the regulatory agencies that they don't, you know, they may want you to do more animals or they may, may want you to, to consider different doses and things like that. Um, once that IND meeting is, is completed, then the protocols are submitted to the on-site uh, committees. Um, then once everything is manufactured, the toxicology is completed. All of that goes into an IND document that's submitted uh, to the agencies. They have 30 days to approve. If they don't do that within 30 days, it's automatically approved. Uh, an IND number is assigned, and then the IRB uh, releases the trial and it can start. Okay. Please interrupt me if you have questions um, as I go through this. Don't save them to the end. Okay. So, I put this slide in here this morning because uh, I was asked some questions yesterday about this, but a pre-IND meeting uh, really 
is a forum to discuss the study objectives and design. What is the scientific rationale of doing this? How, what's the toxicology study design look like? What is the previous human experience, either with this class of molecules, if you're doing a gene therapy, compared to a previous human experience with a small molecule drug? Uh, why, should you con why should a gene therapy be considered when there's a pre-existing therapy already on the market? Um, what's the intended patient population? How are you gonna accrue the patients? What are the doses and the dose escalation plans? How are the patients going to be monitored? Um, and other aspects, stopping rules. You know, if, if, if there's a serious adverse event encountered, how, how is the trial going to be stopped and monitored? Okay. The IND itself has the clinical investigational plan, the protocol, what's called the CMC section, which is how the product is made um, and how is it uh, tested. The pharmacology and toxicology data, IRB approval, and then any previous human experience. Okay, so identifying a lead. You guys are all involved in identifying leads. I don't really have to spend too much time on this other than to say that it requires uh, a very diverse background and skills that I think most of you in the audience have um, as you make those discoveries and, and, and show that they are safe uh, initially in animals, then you can call it a lead, okay? And th that lead then gets manufactured under these regulations uh, in the U.S. It's uh, Title 21 of the Code of Federal Regulations. There's also the International Committee on Harmonization. There's going to be Italian regulations. There's going to be uh, European regulations. So there are a lot of regulations that describe how these products can be made and tested in humans, okay? The CFR are just the, the rules of the US government. Um, the CGMPs are a subset of those rules, again, Title 21 is how drugs are manufactured and tested. Um, the fundamentals of, of good manufacturing practices are that the people making these things are well trained, that there's documentation. So our facility operates on around 2,500 documents that describe how the facility is run, how the equipment is maintained, how the equipment's used, how the facility is cleaned, how you actually manufacture the products. Um, took about two and a half years to write those documents because if it's not written down, if the data is not captured, um, then it never happened. You can't, you cannot convince the regulatory agencies that something happened if it wasn't captured in writing. Okay, so uh, documentation is a huge thing. Written procedures, um, the identification of suitable raw materials, good communication, um, maintenance, calibration, and validation, not only of the facility and the procedures, but also of the test methods. Okay, it's a huge amount of work. The critical elements of control are, are the control of what goes into the process, identifying and sourcing suitable raw materials. Sodium chloride that you buy from Sigma is great for your, re for, your re excuse me, for your research lab, but sourcing sodium chloride that has traceability and has analysis done to it uh, is what you need as starting materials for these, for these, um, for these products. Um, you also have to control what inadvertently goes into the process. So um, flakes of skin from people is the major source of contamination in a manufacturing environment. That's why people are gowned from head to toe with no visible flesh, um, how waste, how the air is cleaned, and, and where product intermediates and products are actually stored. Okay. 
the control of the actual operation through the validation of the process, um, calibrating equipment, sampling, doing analytical testing, and training people is all about controlling the process that it's repeated the same way according to the written record. And then testing what the product is. Okay. So these people here are gowned up to protect the product, not to protect themselves. Again, these products are going into sick people for the first time. They're expected to be sterile. They're expected to be well characterized. So the process is controlled to be reproducible, consistent, give you as much product as you can get out of a manufacturing cycle, and uh, it also needs to be aseptic. Again, there's no terminal sterilization of these products. And those products have the characteristics that they have to be safe, pure, potent, and stable. Okay, it doesn't do anybody any good if you have a product finished product on day zero and then it doesn't store well by the time it gets to the patient. And we'll, I can talk more about that. So essentially for these processes, there's upstream processes that involves a seed train, fermentation, and then a harvest of, of uh, the product in the, in the context of a very complex mixture and then the downstream processing involves separations, filtrations, chromatography, uh, bulk formulations. Um, do you mix it with an excipient? Does it have to be mixed in with sugar? Does it have to have any other kinds of stabilizers? And then it's filled and finished into vials. Okay, so large-scale production. Uh, these are fermenters. We have fermenters at 400 liter scale to culture um, mammalian-based cells, disrupting those cells, harvesting the product that may be inside the cell, and then doing filtration to separate particulate cell membranes and things like that from uh, the product supernatant. And then on the downstream side, you know, you're working with, with chromatography on a, on a huge scale. These columns are in the 100 liter scale to capture and purify the product. And then when it's time to fill and finish the product, uh, here this is our automated filler. This puts dispenses um, liquids into vials and then crimps the vials for um, uh, um, for extraction with a syringe and a needle at the bedside. But things are filled into vials. We also do bag filling, bottles, tubes if you have an ointment, or, or directly into syringes. This is more and more what the pharmaceutical companies are, are going towards. They want the drug already in the syringe in the doctor's office. They don't want the doctor, and it's already predetermined dose that's in the syringe. Okay, so that kind of describes the manufacturing process. Okay, so that manufacturing process needs to be very in a very mature state by the time it's uh, by the time you're ready to do preclinical toxicology studies because the manufacturing process that's going to be used to make the human product has to essentially be used to make the toxicology material. And the reason is, is because if you have a three-step chromatography process and a filtration process, um, it's going to carry certain impurities. You may not even have defined what those impurities are, but you need to have those same impurities going into your animal toxicology study to show that that process um, is not acutely toxic or, or chronically toxic. So when you enter into these toxicology studies, that's done under this set of laws called good laboratory practices. Again, there's a, 
ICH equivalent of 21 CFR 58. These are these written documents. These, by the way, th these documents do not tell you how to conduct a toxicology study. They tell you what the expectation is for controlling toxicology studies. Um, what, so there, in those regulations, there would be an expectation that you know the purity of the agent that you're putting into the animals. It doesn't tell you how to test that purity. Is it SDS page gels? Is it Western blots? Is it um, some other technology? It just says you have to test that it's pure. So um, these regulations, again, they don't tell you how to conduct these toxicology trials, but they do tell you what the expectations are. Um, and the expectations here are that the data that's generated is accurate and valid. Um, and then the quality of the study article, the, the, the agent that you're trying to test in the animals, uh, has been uh, produced and tested and documented um, to a certain degree. Okay, so agents that go into toxicology studies, there's an expectation that you've done sterility testing. There's an expectation that you've done endotoxin testing. And the reason that is, is because if it's not sterile and if it's not endotoxin free, those impurities or contaminants can influence the toxicology study, right? If you have animals that are having sepsis because there's too much endotoxin in the product, that's going to skew the results of the toxicology study. Okay, so what parameters do you look for in these tox studies? Uh, the distribution, if you're doing a gene therapy, you're looking for the biodistribution of the vector in various organs uh, and gonads. You're looking at uh, tox toxicity levels, whether it's liver enzymes or mu muscle enzymes. You're looking at the immune responses. Uh, you're doing histological analyses of the various organs, uh, genotoxicity. And what you're really trying to do in these studies is determine a dose that has no effect, a minimum effective dose, so you have some marker of efficacy in your animals where you're trying to determine what the minimum effective dose is, what's the maximum tolerated dose, and then what's the lethal dose, okay? And then finally, we have good clinical practices. And again, uh, these are written uh, uh, regulations that are designed to protect patients, um, require these institutional review boards at the site of the clinical trial, and then uh, mundane things such as uh, electronic records and electronic signatures um, we do everything on paper that has real signatures, but if you use an electronic system, uh, there is a requirement to validate that system. Um, I won't go too much into that. Okay, so product development, um, phase one trials, is they are really a balance between product development and scientific inquiry and generating safety data. And then once you're beyond phase one, you're really into a development mode where you're meeting the requirements for product licensure. You're, the whole goal, again, at least from a pharmaceutical company's point of view, is to get a license to sell these products, okay? So all of the um, activities are really geared towards meeting the requirements for product licensure. So in the United States, there's now a new clinical trial called a phase zero clinical trial. That's an exploratory study where the dose is one one hundredth of what's expected. So if you've done animal efficacy and you've treated an animal for, for congestive heart failure and you know what the, what the um, excuse me, can I, do you have a question? Um, if, if you've done efficacy in animals for 
congestive heart failure and you know what the dose is, you, in a phase zero, you would actually do a subtherapeutic dose of less than um, one one hundredth of what was efficacious in the animals. And the, the rationale for this is that animal studies don't always tell you the whole story. And so drug companies want to test several candidates, lead candidates, in humans as quickly as they can and determine which one may be um, uh, better from a pharmacokinetic point of view. Okay. Phase one clinical trial, again, these are, this is the initial study. You're looking at safety evaluation. You're trying to determine what side effects are associated with increasing doses, and you're looking for evidence of effectiveness in humans. Those trials may include healthy patients, and you're really doing some dose scouting, okay, dose ranging um, studies. In a phase two trial, uh, this is a controlled clinical trial, usually involves a placebo. The phase 2A uh, is really looking at dosing. Phase 2B, you're, you're looking at efficacy endpoints. Again, safety is a major aspect of this. What is the minimum effective dose? What's the maximum tolerated dose? Any short-term side effects? Um, then in phase three, it becomes expanded, it becomes a randomized, controlled, multi-center, so now you're not just at one location, you're recruiting more and more patients. Um, again, uh, product safety, you're trying to gather additional information to evaluate uh, the risk-benefit relationship of the, of the drug. Um, and then this, this, this point here, um, the basis for labeling. So when you get a drug, I don't know about this country, but in America when you get a drug it comes with this sheet. Okay, okay. So that, the labeling is taken extremely seriously by the regulatory agency. This is how, what are the side effects, what are the, how do you use the drug and things like that. So these studies are really driving what goes into that, that label. Okay. If your phase three goes well, they issue a license, you get to sell your product. Okay, so, but there's an expectation that even after you sell the product that you are doing post-marketing surveillance. Okay, the Vioc study where um, people were dropping dead after the product was licensed. Um, that is a very good example of phase four surveillance. So they pulled that drug from the market because there was a subset of human beings that couldn't tolerate it. That never came up in phase three, phase two, or phase one trials. Okay. So as you go from phase one to phase three, there's an expectation by all regulatory bodies that the product becomes better characterized. Okay. Um, that you understand what impurities are there, you understand um, the stability of the product, etc. The product manufacturing is required to become more and more controlled. So I'll give you an example. Um, for phase one, if you autoclave something for GMP manufacturing, you can just put in one of those little indicators, you know, these little um, um, Vial indicators, you put it in with the load, and if it's killed, great, you record that. Out here at phase three, you require a GMP autoclave that's fully mapped that costs about $500,000. Okay, so as you move, there's this more and more control. This whole process takes about a decade to start. This is your pre-IND, so once you have a lead out here, to get through the clinical trials and everything, to get your biologic license application approved to sell products, takes about a billion dollars now. Okay, so as you move from discovery towards 
a new drug application, the value of the intellectual property that you've invented becomes more and more uh, val valuable, okay? So if you have, you know, you, you, you identify this gene, it cures cystic fibrosis in a mouse model, you patent that gene, um, as you show that it's safe in animals at high doses, as you show that you can actually manufacture the product, as you show that it's safe in humans and efficacious in humans, as the further you move along this line, the value of that invention goes up by orders of magnitude. Okay. So who does it take to do this? Okay. So I've, I've used the word uh, company here, but again, this really applies also in academic settings if you're going to pursue a project like this. Okay, so um, I don't need to read this to you, but teamwork is a huge part of this. Good communication, teamwork, diversified expertise. Um, the people that have to come together are people in R&D, manufacturing, quality control, quality assurance, regulatory affairs. These people speak with the regulatory agencies in a way that doesn't compromise the project. It's a delicate art. Uh, folks that are in business, it could be just your director here, but he, he has to go and find money to make this happen, and then administering uh, the project. Okay, so um, the discovery could be, take two different routes. You could discover something in-house, like I heard yesterday, or if you're a company, you can in-license. Um, uh, Pfizer goes and looks at lots of different technologies in the world, and if they see something that's interesting, they can in-license that. Um, and then a process has to be developed. So it has to, to manufacture the product. So it has to be designed. You have to identify the raw materials, the various equipment. You have to work with clinicians early to determine what that product looks like. So if you're making an AV vector to treat um, the heart, you need to be working with the clinicians to know, is that going to be delivered with a catheter? Is that going to be uh, directly injected somehow? What is the formulation? Um, how is it going to be mixed at the bedside and delivered to the patient? So you really need to have an idea of what that product is going to look like from a clinician point of view, and then develop this plan to manufacture it. So when you go to manufacture something, uh, you have what's called the drug substance and you have the drug product. Okay? The drug substance is the active pharmaceutical ingredient. So if you're making an AV vector, that would be the AV vector. But then that vector has to be formulated. Maybe it has an excipient, maybe it uh, has to be co-injected with some other molecule. And whatever that final product is, uh, is identified as the drug product. And so to do that, you start with your cDNA, you engineer a cell line, uh, you have to do process development, you make master cell banks, you, you generate the, the, the protein for the clinic, which is your drug substance. At the same time, you're developing assays and analytical technology, and you're determining the specifications of that product. Is it 10 milligrams per mil? Is it 10 to the 10th vector genomes per mil? Uh, how pure does it have to be if you're injecting it into the brain versus giving it orally? The purity c can be very different. Um, and then characterizing the product from a, from a sterility standpoint, an adventitious agent standpoint. Formulating the drug, you know, um, is it going to be stored frozen? Is it going to be again, delivered in the catheter, does it 
absorb to the materials in the catheter? Do you have to actually, in order to get your delivered dose, if you want to deliver 10 to the 10th vector genomes into the brain, but your catheter or your needle absorbs 50% of the vector, well, you have to formulate it such that you're going to actually deliver the dose that you're, you're intending. And then the formulation to make sure that the product is stable during storage, during transport, but that also this formulation is compatible. A formulation for the heart may be very different than a formulation for the brain or the eye uh, and working through that. Okay, so the, the point I'm trying to make here is that 70 to 80 percent of the time and the resources that are needed to bring a product to the clinic are spent with all of this upfront work. Okay, generating the cell substrates, developing processes, developing analytical methods, developing the specifications, and developing that formulation. So if I have a million dollar contract to make a product, $700,000 to $800,000 of that is spent in a, a development setting, in a, in, a, almost in a research lab setting. It takes about nine months out of a year. So if it takes a year to manufacture that product, nine months of it are spent doing these things. And the most critical thing I want you to appreciate is that this is all based in science. Okay, this is not manufacturing. What happens here is really smart people are working on very difficult product, pro, uh, problems to to develop a process for manufacturing, to develop the analytical technology. Once that's set, then it gets transferred into the manufacturing facility where it spends a very short period of time. It gets manufactured according to the documents and it's off to the clinic. So um, people with your, ex with your backgrounds and expertise in cell biology, biochemistry, molecular biology, they're doing this stuff but they're just applying that knowledge more to product development rather than um, just pure research. Okay. Um, what we're doing in process development for the drug substance is we're trying to maximize the yield to reduce the cost of goods. The more your cell line produces, the cheaper it's going to be to make that product. Um, maximize the purity, the potency, and the stability, identify raw materials, scaling, determining sampling points. A batch record is the cookbook for manufacturing the product. So we are manufacturing right now a cell therapy product. That's a T cell therapy product. It has over 200 steps, and the batch record is 89 pages long. Okay, outlining every single step that's required to manufacture that. So I know that you all have protocols, mini prep DNA protocols and PCR protocols and things like that. They're one sheet, you just write these steps. Um, we take that to the extreme in a batch record. Every single step, every single lot of raw material, every item that touches that process is captured in a batch record. Okay. And then for the drug product, you're really needing to determine the number of vials that you're going to need for your clinical trial. So somebody comes to me and they say, well, we need 10 to the 14th vector genomes for my clinical trial. Well, for a clinical trial, what you're giving the patient is, is derived from a single-use vial. Okay. So if you fill that vial with 10 to the 13th vector genomes, then you need 10 of those vials to treat somebody with 10 to the 14th vectors, okay? If you have any sub-portion of that, you're still consuming a whole vial. So when somebody comes to me and they say, I need 10 to the 14th vector genomes, really we sit down and we do the hard math and we determine how many vials, what is the dose per vial, because if you're doing a dose escalation, if you're doing 10 to the 13, 5 times 10 to the 13 and 10 to the 14, you can't fill the vials with a different volume. 
because if you fill the vials with a different volume, each one of those volumes has to be tested separately on, st on a stability study, okay? Um, so you fill the vials and then you, you fill that accordingly so you can meet all of the different um, doses that you want. Um, when you fill that vial, you have the fill volume. Uh, so there's a pump that's delivering that volume. And if you need to pull a mil one milliliter out of that vial and your pump has 2% accuracy, then you need to be filling it with um, 1. Uh, 1 1.02, you know, so, so a mil plus 20 microliters so that you're guaranteed that there's a mil in that vial every time. Then there's the delivered volume, which is if you have this vial at the bedside, how much can you physically pull out with a syringe and a needle? So if you need to deliver a, a mil, and you have a, this vial, but you can really only pull out 0.9 milliliters with your syringe, then you actually have to fill the vial with 1.2 mils so that you get one mil every time. So going through these exercises, um, I know this sounds really mundane, but at the end of the day, to have a successful clinical trial, you have to start at that bench side. You have to really, at the bedside, you have to really think about what you're going to put into patients, what's it look like, is it a liquid, what are the excipients, and things like that to determine the formulation, how much do I need to deliver, and then you work backwards from that to determine how much you actually have to make. Okay? Then you establish the specifications, uh, what is the concentration, how many vector genomes per mil, what's the purity, you know, is my, if my clinical trial is five years long, you know, how stable is my product, okay? Then you have, have to, sorry, here you have to develop the methods to test the product, which, again, having assays that are specific. You, th you know, you're doing a PCR assay and you think that your, um, that your PCR target and your PCR product, whether it's real-time PCR or uh, standard PCR, you, you actually need to show that the assay is specific for what you're testing, whether it's pH, whether it's PCR. Uh, determining the limits of detection, limits of quantification, linearity, range, um, and, and the like. So when you're developing these tests, you actually go through a process called qualification and validation where you're actually testing the test. There are um, activities such as ruggedness tests, robustness tests, and things that, that um, are designed to test the test. How is it performing in different people's hands? If you challenge it, let's say you have an incubation step at 37 degrees, Celsius, can you incubate that step at 39? Let's say your water bath moves a little bit and it's 39 degrees Celsius. If you do validation to show that the assay still performs at 39 degrees Celsius, if the water bath drifts, then you don't have to throw that result away. If you're actually doing the test and your water bath accidentally goes to 39, you would by law have to throw that result away because the test was done out of specification. But if you do these validations and show the tolerances of the test, then you can work within those ranges. Okay. So the manufacturing unit is responsible, obviously, for making the product. They're operating the equipment. They're manufacturing ancillary materials. If you're doing chromatography, they have to manufacture buffers. They have to manufacture uh, other components that go into the process. Um, they do environmental control. That means the temperature of the facility, the air cleanliness, and things like that. They draft and follow written procedures, and they're recording all of the activities they're doing on forms, things that can go back uh, in time to, and can be reviewed by the regulatory agencies. We have a whole facilities department that is 
their sole responsibility is to make sure that the facility is operating within its specifications. So if we have a, a specification for the cleanliness of the room, these guys are making sure that that specification is met. Um, and they're doing maintenance. They also ship and receive, receive raw materials and ship product. Okay. Quality control and quality assurance are really responsible for the quality of the product. And ultimately that gets back to protecting the patient. The quality control unit is demonstrating product safety, that it's sterile, that it's free of endotoxin, that it doesn't have HIV in it. Um, they characterize the product. They determine the vector, um, the, the titer of the vector, um, show that the lots are consistent, show that the product is stable, and then do um, the testing of the facility and the people to make sure that's all clean. Quality assurance has the oversight responsibility to ensure that all of the regulations are being met. So this is like the internal police, okay? They're going around doing audits, they're doing spot checks. Um, they're independent of manufacturing and quality control. They review records and reports, they audit. Um, and then they do what's called document control. So I talked about the 2,500 documents that we have. Um, each one of those has a number. Each one of those is issued to people. It's all tracked. And then if that document changes, let's say we decide that pH 9 isn't the right pH, that it should be pH 7, all the old versions are pulled back from people. They're destroyed and then a new version with a new number is given back to people. And that's how you eliminate making these mistakes. Um, they do investigations. If you change the process, there's a whole uh, change control procedure. Qualify vendors that provide uh, raw materials. They do inspections. Um, and then they have the ultimate authority to release the raw materials that are used in manufacturing and to use the product in the clinic, okay? So I kind of went through these different responsibilities, but you know, at the end of the day, all of these different groups have to work together to get something to the clinic. So they all have defined responsibilities, and in a small company setting or an academic setting, uh, one employee may function in different areas. However, the splitting of those responsibilities must be in a way that maintains the checks and balances. So you have a group that manufactures and you have a separate group, quality control, that's checking the quality of that product. And then you have quality assurance, which makes sure that, so you have quality control that's checking the quality of that product. They're independent of manufacturing. And then you have quality assurance that is checking that quality control did everything correctly and that manufacturing did everything correctly. So all of these checks and balances, the separation, so you could not have somebody in quality assurance also doing quality control and vice versa. You can't have a single person who's involved in manufacturing during quality control. Those all have to be separated. Okay. Then that product gets delivered to the investigational pharmacy in the hospital, and they have to get trained because those pharmacists in most cases have never worked with these types of agents, whether they're cell therapies or gene therapies. They need to know not to vortex cells that kill them. They need to know that they have to use wide bore needles and things to transfer some of these agents. Um, from the time you thaw a vial to the time it goes up to the ward and gets delivered to a patient, how much time is that? Do you thaw at 8 a.m.? Is it still good if you inject the patient at 4 p.m.? You have to do all of those stability studies, not only of the product while you're manufacturing it, but then at, when, while you're actually using it, okay? The reality is that small startup companies in academia um, require employees to wear many hats, um, and as long as those checks and balances are, are um, maintained, everything should be in compliance. 
with the laws. Okay. So to develop a project, um, again, you've identified uh, uh, a lead to treat a disease. What do you do? Well, as a company, you need to evaluate the market potential. As an academic, you don't necessarily have to. And you want to get that lead product into the cl clinic on its way to licensure. So you have to form a team. Um, you develop a project plan and timeline. You allocate resources. And then you execute that plan and monitor the progress according to the plan. And the, the main project cost drivers are the amount of product that's needed. Again, it's driven by the doses and how you ultimately put it into the vials and how many vials you need for toxicology, clinical, and stability studies. Um, the manufacturing process is a major driver. Um, making reagents such as cell banks uh, um, and, and buffers and things like that. Some of those manufacturing cycles can be a long time and require people and space. The analytical methods, again, I think the, the major costs here are manpower. It's not necessarily these, the reagents, as expensive as those can be at times. And then early choices have a very major impact. So fast and easy usually equals slow. And what I mean by that is in a research lab, you want to uh, test a protein in an animal model. And you don't know how to purify it, so you his tag it. And then you purify it on a nickel column. And it's fast, it's easy. But, and then you cure the animal, and you're ready for the clinic, right? Well, no, you're not, because you have to go back. You have to re-engineer. You have to get rid of the his tag, because it's immunogenic. You have to then develop a purification process that relies on classical chroma chromatographic steps that doesn't rely on a nickel tag and things like that. So um, those early choices have a huge impact. Um, again, the expression cassette, if you're using a weak promoter and there's a new promoter from Invitrogen that gives you 10 times more protein, um, you probably want to switch to that. And then ultimately, intellectual property. Some companies may allow you to use their intellectual property. Some may not. Um, the project manager coordinates the team and monitors project, uh, project progress, um, develops the master plan and timeline, identifies the people needed, and those people come in at different phases. So you talk to the clinician at the beginning and you really get a good sense of what the clinical trial should look like and the toxicology. Then you go into this whole manufacturing and testing phase and then you come back to the clinician. So, there are different inputs from different people all along the project. Um, acquiring resources and the budget usually involves getting buy-in from upper management. And then communicating the status of the project between all members, including the clinicians. So if you're four months away from having the product, you need to start telling the clinician to start enrolling patients and getting um, things ready to conduct the clinical trial. Um, I think I'll skip this slide. I mean, you, you can read some of this, but, but looking at, you know, along the project, different resources have to come and go. Um, sometimes you need to throw a lot of people at something for a short period of time and then take them away and put them on a different project. Um, in terms of the timeline and the roadmap, when does the project, product need to be delivered? Um, what is the budget, the master schedule for, for the manufacturing and, and, and the like? Um, to, to be able to handle a project of this magnitude, you really have to break it into phases. So there's the clinical and the preclinical design, raw material sourcing, developing assays, optimizing the process. Um, determining the formulation, and then actually doing the manufacturing and, and the test and lot release, and then preparing all the documents for all phases, not just manufacturing, but the clinical phases and the toxicology phases. 
Okay, so what does that mean? That means that there's a ton of jobs out there that you probably, well, you might not have ever heard of. So, you know, somebody running quality assurance for a company makes $300,000 a year. Uh, quality control, the head of quality control for a large pharmaceutical company makes huge money. People that understand this whole product development and translational research and um, uh, clinical development aspects, I mean, if you go and get a law degree, you become invaluable because there aren't a lot of lawyers out there that understand this uh, to bring these products to market. And then again, also in business. So hybrid jobs where you understand the science and you understand business or legal um, are, are in very high demand. If you go on to monster.com and look at the job opportunities, just type in quality assurance, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of openings because there just aren't people with this experience. Okay, so from a professional development point of view, um, you all already have the background, okay? You have the scientific knowledge. You know cell biology, molecular biology, biochemistry, the various disciplines. Um, you've had your practical training, you're getting your PhDs, or you're getting your master's degrees, and you, you know how, to, how these technologies work. But to appreciate the cultural differences between what's going on in academia or versus business and understanding uh, how a translational product project, even in an academic setting, is very different than doing uh, your normal individual research uh, is critical. So the main drivers there are teamwork, uh, understanding a project in its entirety and understanding these timelines and limited resources and things like that. Um, if you can understand how to apply your scientific knowledge to these efforts and working in, in a team, uh, understanding the various drivers, understanding the regulatory aspects, you make yourself invaluable. I mean, you, you become highly marketable uh, to companies and to academic institutions who are trying to develop uh, translational activities. Um, the differences between academia and industry are a translational aspect. And, I, and I, let me digress for a second. In the United States, if you're involved in translational research and you're doing team-based science in academia, the administrations of universities are really struggling to determine what constitutes um, success in terms of getting tenure and getting promoted. So usually those metrics are if you publish a certain number of papers or you get a certain number of grants, you get tenure. Um, but if you're working in a team where you're on a paper with 50 authors and you're, you're doing a lot of things like process development and analytical development that are not necessarily publishable works, how do you measure that success, at least in an academic um, setting? And that's something that, that is under a lot of debate in, in the United States, at least. So you know, what are, how do you get promoted and rewarded? What are the measures of success? Um, certainly in a company, if you're Genentech and you invented Herceptin and your company's making a billion dollars and you have Genentech stock, you know what your measures of success and your rewards are. Um, the resources, I think, are, are different if you're at a company versus academia. Knowing how you apply the knowledge in the different settings. If you run an SDS page gel, if you go back up to your labs right now and run an SDS page gel, um, you're doing the exact same thing as a quality control, uh, as a person in quality control. But they're doing it in a way that's compliant with the regulations and they get paid a lot more money because they know how to run that SDS page gel in compliance with the regulations. Um, 
You need to be able to adapt. Again, I think we're all trained academically to focus on our project and kind of have a very narrow focus on what we're doing. But um, adapting to working in teams and to working under pressure and, and working with limited uh, timelines and things like that uh, is critical. Um, not applying one culture to another and uh, learning while you're in those different settings. Um, and there are other things you can do offline or online uh, to prepare for, your, for a career that's based in translational activities versus basic science. Um, and certainly preparing for a job interview is critical. There are online forums. Science Magazine now has a whole section online and in print based on career development. And then uh, there are various courses that are available. So with that, thank you very much.